So a little bit of background on Python and where it came from, uh, because I think it's sort of valuable to know a little bit of the history so you understand what what the deal is with Python, really. Um, it was created by a guy named Guido Van Rossum. That's an actual picture. He looks like a Guido, I think, a little bit. Um, maybe not in the like Italian mafia kind of sense, but maybe just in the I'm a nerd who invents computer languages kind of sense. But um, he was a scientist, not necessarily just strictly a computer guy. And he was using uh, a, a computer programming language. I believe the flavor he was using was called ABC, believe it or not. A uh, really creative name, I know. And that language was used for scientific computing. So he's a scientist who was using a computer language to do his scientific work, to analyze data, to do calculations, that kind of stuff. And as he was working, he thought, I really wish the language I'm using had this feature or that feature or did this a little bit differently. And ultimately, he decided to modify the language that he was using and created the Python language. Very few programming languages are just materialized from scratch. Like, nobody sits down one day and says, I'm going to create a brand new computer language. Well, I guess they do sometimes, but it's pretty rare. Most of the time, languages are derivatives of previous languages. That's just kind of how things are built. And in computing, in general, in software development and all of computing, that happens a lot. We share things, we modify them, we play around and we resubmit it back to the universe and, and then somebody else takes it and modifies it and makes it better. That's how we make progress. So Python, what's so great about it? Number one thing is it's easy to learn. Don't take that to mean that it's not very powerful because it's super powerful as we'll find out in just a moment. It just happens to be easy to learn. So it's sort of the best of both worlds, especially if you're just getting into programming. It's both easy to learn and it can do a lot, which kind of makes it fun to play with. Um, I talked about this a little bit on Wednesday, but it uses a more natural language. So when you're reading Python code, it will read not like regular English, but if you read it out loud or to yourself, you can kind of make sense of what it's doing just by looking at it. Maybe not 100%, but you can get quite a bit of the way there just by looking at what the code says. And in other languages, I can just tell you that's not possible. If you've ever tried to program in iOS, especially before they brought Swift, that's a, a language that is not very fun or easily readable. So natural language is really nice. And Python was built on purpose that way. It's both versatile and extensible, meaning number one, it can do a lot of things. But number two, anything it can't do, you can make it do by adding to the language. You can actually add your own modules, which gives you the ability to create custom functions and all kinds of things. And basically, what that means is you can do almost anything you want with Python, anything your imagination can dream up. So, um, and finally, it has a great user community. Um, one of the best of all programming languages, to be honest. There's literally millions of Python users out there, and lots and lots of them are contributing their ideas or their strategies, and in many cases, even their code. So if you wanted to go out there and find some code that will do something for you, most of the time you can do it. And most of the time, if you, there's a module that you want to develop that does something special, like lets you control your toaster from the internet, there's probably a module for that. Okay. So, and if there's not, you can make one and you can submit it and you can be somebody else's hero. So in case you're worried that Python's not like a real language, this is just a partial list of all of the companies out there, big ones, who are using Python, not just for development, not just for research, but in production. That means something that they're doing that's an actual product that they sell to users uses Python. You've got Yahoo, you've got Google, you've got Netflix, YouTube, Instagram, Amazon, and lots and lots of other ones. One of the, one of the ones, ironically, that you don't see up here is Microsoft. Although they don't advertise it, they do use it because my son spent his whole summer, last summer, programming Python for Microsoft. So 
these are just the ones that own it, right? There are probably plenty of companies out there that are using Python for lots and lots of stuff. What can you do with it? Almost anything, right? All of these things and more. Um, some of these things like machine learning, artificial intelligence, Python is the go-to language. It's not just one of many options. It's like the thing, if you want to do this, you will use Python because that's what that's what people are using for it. But again, all these things and more. Python is considered a high level language. Now, when we think of high level, you probably think that means it's like great or evolved or whatever. But what it really means is Python has several layers in between it and the computer. And if you're a programming snob, you might say, well, that makes Python less powerful because you're limited. You can't access the CPU directly or access memory slots directly. That's true. You can't do that stuff. But my response to that is nobody cares anymore. It used to be in the good old days, the golden age of computing, when you used to have to have intimate knowledge of the computer's hardware in order to write good programs that ran quickly and did, their, did what they were supposed to. It also required a very, very high level of expertise to develop those programs. Python does that stuff for you so that you can focus on the functionality of your software. That's what high level means. So a low level programming language like C++ is very close to the hardware, meaning it allows you very direct, very specific control over the computer's hardware, which for some very specific applications is, is still desirable, like writing an operating system like Windows or Linux, things that actually have to interact with the hardware. You still need to use a language like C++. But when it comes to just writing software that people can use or software that does something, Python works great. And the way this works is you've got Python. Some of you had to download Python in addition to PyCharm so that you could run your scripts. You've got the Python engine. So if you write a Python script, .py, and you run it, Python takes that and it says, okay, here's the ways I need to interact with the computer itself. I manage the memory. I manage the hardware. I tell it what to display, all that stuff. And then it just gives you the output. But you don't have to worry about this. This is just happening all by itself. So if you write a valid Python script, uh, the high-level language takes care of the really tricky, really technical communication with the computer itself. To be honest with you, I would rather program in Python than almost any other language because I don't really like to mess with that stuff. I just like to build cool things. And that's what Python really allows you to do. So. In this class, we'll be writing, testing, and running all of our programs within PyCharm. PyCharm is called an IDE, which stands for Integrated Development Environment. What that means is that you can just do all of that stuff, testing and debugging and running and compiling and file management and module management, all happens within PyCharm. That's really convenient. Because before we had integrated development environments, you might have to use three or four different programs or different windows that you had open doing all the different things. Now you do it all in one place. It saves you a lot of time because if you're writing a thousand lines of code and you're trying to get it to work correctly, you might have to go back and forth and run that program and try that code out and debug it 600 times. And if that happens every time you have to manage multiple windows, it slows you down. It just takes more time. So an IDE like PyCharm is really beneficial. PyCharm is not just for teaching and learning how to use Python though. Almost every developer I know that uses PyCharm or uses Python as a development platform uses PyCharm. So this is, if you go out there in the industry and you're writing Python code, you will use PyCharm or something very similar to it. Everybody uses IDEs now to develop code. It's just faster and better and you waste the less time. Okay, so let's get into functions. When I introduce new functions, I usually will use this template. You can also find something very similar to this on the class website in the function reference. So if you ever need to look up a function and find out how it works, 
Um, that's an easy way to do it. But essentially, the function we've already discussed, the print function, takes an object and prints it to the screen. There are several options that are called parameters that you can use to specify how that happens. The first one is the object or objects. Print can take multiple objects and print them to a line just in the same way you did with A1, right? We said, hello world, like this, and it printed it. I can also give it multiple objects. There's one, and there's two. Now I've given it two separate objects, separated by a comma. Let me make this a little bit bigger font. Excuse me just for one moment. That's a little bit better. I think that's as big as it goes. So, hello world. Notice there's no space in between them, right? But when I print, when I run this code, I'm still getting a space. And that is because when you provide multiple objects to a print function, it will automatically insert by default a space in between them. Now, one of the optional parameters is called separator. It's SEP equals, and then I would put a separator. It can be any string that you want to use instead of the space. So if I go SEP equals hyphen, and I run that, it will use a hyphen. I can use any string in there. And every time I add okay there's a third object so and you can see the separator here and here why no separator here because it's part of the string right so it has to write the space there because I told it to So if I also look at this, it has a parameter called end. At the end of each line, when you, at the end of each line in the print function, it will automatically insert a carriage return so that the next line will start on the line below it. But if I don't want to do that, I could actually have it end with any character I want. And now you'll notice that this scooted up because I didn't insert a carriage return there. So instead of a, an invisible character that says go to the next line, I used an asterisk. And I can, because these are optional and because they're named parameters where I'm saying the name equals, I can, I can use one or the other or I could leave them both off. And in cases where I leave them both off, it just uses whatever the default is. So going back, the default is separate them with a space and then put a carriage return at the end of it. You can't see the carriage return, but it's there. So that's the print function. Now, some functions do something. The print function is a do something per a do something function. When it when you invoke that function or call that function and you pass that a parameter, it does something. And then its work is finished. Other functions return something. Instead of doing something like printing to the screen, they return a value. So they send it back to you or send it back to the program. And you either have to capture that or use a do something to do something with it. So an example of that is input. The input function will prompt the user to provide input. So it takes one parameter, and that parameter is an input prompt. 
which can be any object, usually it's a string. So you might say, this is the question that you wanna ask the user, the prompt, and then the computer will pause and wait for the user to enter some kind of input or response to the question. So this is not what the input returns. Input does print out a prompt and then it returns a value. So one way to one way to deal with that or use that is I can just put the input inside of the print statement. Input what is your name? Okay, so now this is going to do a couple of things. The first thing it's going to do is it's going to output what is your name? And then it's going to pause. And that's just the input statement. And whatever I type when it does that then gets returned to the print statement, which then gets printed out. So when I run that, the way it looks is, there you go, what is your name? And if I type Bill, then it prints it out because it's asking me, this is the prompt, this is the question, and my answer gets taken by the input and pushed back to print, which then gets sent to the screen. Everybody following still? Okay. So another way to handle that is by using what's called a variable. So if I say x equals input what is your name, x does not equal what is your name, x equals the answer to that question. So the answer to that question is sent by input and put in a container. Think of it as a box that is empty. I put that in there. And then later on, on the next line, I say, okay, now print whatever's in that box. So this will have the exact same effect as what I did before. But what I did before is I took the input and I just printed it. This way I'm putting in, I'm putting the results of the input into a box. And then on the next line, I'm taking that box and printing it. But to the user, it looks exactly the same. See, what is your name? Bill, and then it prints it out. Does the same thing. One has more lines. The second one is probably a little bit more readable. And it would allow me later on that bill is still in that box. So I could print it in a variety of different situations. So when it asks me now, see now it'll print, it prints what's in that box two times and then it prints it as one of two objects in this. So I can use a variable here and then I can use a string because it's just gonna print those all on the same line and it's gonna put a space in between them. So that's a great way to take user input and format it, which is what we're gonna be doing later this week for the Mad Libs assignment. So the variable comes into play here in the sample code And uh, the interesting thing here is that they're using, in this sample code, this isn't mine, but they're using a plus sign to put together this variable with this string. So they're, before they print it, they're smushing them together. It's actually a little bit easier, in my opinion, to print them as two separate objects because it'll put the space in in between automatically. Otherwise, you kind of have to figure out what you're doing ahead of time. So what is a variable? A variable is just a named container. That's it. We can have an unlimited number of variables in every program and we can reuse them. We can change the value. The value of a variable is just a way of saying what's in that box, what's in that variable. So the value of variable can be a string like bill, or it can be a number like 43, or it can be 
a variety of other things. It could even be a list or a list of objects, uh, which you can get a little bit crazy if you go too far down that road before we're ready. But a variable can represent a variety of different things. The value of a variable can change. So X could equal Bill at one moment, and then later in my program, I could change it to 43. And then I could change it back to Bill, which is often a source of confusion for programmers, by the way. A variable in Python is also an object or a class. That means nothing to you, and it won't mean anything to you until we're further, further into the class material. And then you'll, we'll reference this, and you'll be like, oh, I forgot about that. But it is meaningful at that point. Uh, and then the value of a variable also includes what's called a data type. Data type tells you about what kind of data is in that variable. So it, it's a string or an integer. There are really four that we'll talk about in just a minute. But first, I want to go through the rules for naming variables. And these are Python's rules, OK? And then I'll tell you my recommendation. First, it has to start with an underscore character or a letter. Cannot be a number, cannot be any other character. They can only contain A through Z, 0 through 9, and the underscore character. And variable names are case sensitive. Did you have a question? It, it can be either, but here's my recommendation. What I recommend is that you start out with an abbreviation that indicates what kind of data type that variable is. And I would say you want to name it something descriptive. So if I was using a variable in my program that, let's say, represented somebody's first name, I might call it str, what does that stand for? String, it's the data type. And then first name, notice there's no spaces. I could use underscore to separate the word, but I prefer personally to use camel case for all my variables. Camel case, basically in reference to the fact that there's humps in the middle of it, um, refers to you start out lowercase, and each word, each new word in that string or in that group has a capital. So it's readable. So str, first name. Variable names are case sensitive. So Those are all different variables. Now, never, ever, ever do this to yourself as a programmer because you will confuse yourself and go nuts. But these are all four different variables. But it, to us as humans who speak English, they mean the same thing. They're all first names, they're all strings. So whatever method you use, use it consistently for every variable. Now, for me, that means lowercase abbreviation of the data type and then camel case for me. If you don't use that, my second choice would be all lowercase. Easiest, fastest, least likely to run into issues. Okay, those are my recommendations. I will provide you sort of recommendations and best practices as we go through them as we go through this class for lots of things. I will try to make it clear when it's Bill's opinion or Bill's best practices versus this is a hard and fast rule for Python so that you know the difference. This is a best practice. Uh, most of the time, my best practices are because that's what we use out in the industry, out in the, out in the real world. There are a few things that I just personally like to do 
and I'll try and make it clear when it's those things too. But uh, the things that I like to do are from years and years and years of doing things badly and learning the hard way. So sometimes there's value in that too. So if I print, if I run this program, what is it going to do? Jenny, right? Because that's the one that matches. One thing I really like about PyCharm, one of many things, is that once I declare a variable, meaning once I tell it that this variable exists and here's what it equals, and I start typing the name of that variable, it pops up for me into this list. And I can, I can complete that or autocomplete by selecting the one I want and hitting tab. You can save yourself a whole lot of typing. And it does that with functions and classes and objects and all kinds of things. So it's really, really convenient. So variable names and finally, data types. So there's four data types we're going to start with. We're not going to play around with any more than that. There are mm, eight, or, eight or ten data types in Python that we'll play around with eventually, but we're going to start with four. The first one is a string. It's a name of characters, or it's a, it's a group of characters surrounded by quotes. They can be double quotes or single quotes. They do virtually the same thing with a few caveats. In Python, I prefer double. That's just my own preference most of the time. Um, so everything in that string will be printed exactly as it is. You can, if you have the module installed, even include emoji characters in your strings. Okay, so there's a lot of flexibility there. Uh, integer is a whole number, no decimals. Can be positive or negative from infinity one direction to infinity the other, just whole number, no decimals. Floating point is a number with any number of decimals, okay? Also called just a float. Boolean or bool is true or false. Those are the only two values it recognizes. Notice that they are uppercase. If you type x equals true and you write it lowercase, it will think you are referencing a lowercase variable called true. Lots of people make that mistake. So true in the Boolean sense is uppercase, as is false. Just remember that. The, those little things will get you sometimes when you're programming. So so if I have my first name string variable, I could have an int age, okay, and I could have a float, um, what is that, um, let's just do score, I don't know what that means, you can figure it out, 3.5, and then bool married equals true. There we go. Okay, so there's my personal profile in data right there. So a Boolean, a float, an integer, and a string. Now, there's a, one more uh, function that I wanna teach you that might be useful, and that is called type. Okay, type is a return function. It's not an, a do something function. So it's going to return a value, but if you want it to do something with that value, you need to assign it to a variable or you can print it. So I'm going to put it inside a print function. And the argument that it takes is any variable. So if I give it int age and I run that program, you can see it'll tell me what class that belongs to. It's class int, which means it's an integer. This is useful because you can tell the, the type of any variable. If you're getting a weird error, this is one thing you can do to sort of debug the program and say, okay, what's going on? Maybe you have a variable that's not the right type. An example of this would be if I decide to print 
my first name and add that to age. Now, can anybody tell me what Bill plus 47 is? That's a confusing question, right? Because I'm asking you to add a string to a number, which you can't really do. Now, intuitively, you might want to, you might do this, print str first name plus age, if you wanted to print out on a single line, my first name and my age, right? But what it's doing here is it's adding the two. And Python doesn't like that because it doesn't know how to add 47 and Bill. And so when I run that program, what I get is a type error because it doesn't know what to do. You can see here, you know that you ended with an error when error exit code is one. Remember, what's the exit code we want at the end? Zero, right. So if it ends with exit code one, but if, if the red giant red text that says error didn't clue you in, that's how you know. But a type error, and it gives me a little bit more information, can only concatenate, which means basically it's a big word that means you smush together two things, str, not int to str. So if I... Uh, if let's say I did that not knowing what uh, what int age was, maybe I didn't name my variable very well. I could actually find out the type by printing that, or I could use it as a test to see what it is, and I could see that it's an int, and therefore I cannot print that out as that. Now this is an easy fix, right? If I just take that out and put a comma there, then it's going to work fine because all I'm saying here is print this and then print this, not concatenate them. So it's all about what I'm telling it to do. Now, I can I can do this. But let's let's make it a little more interesting rather than printing it. I'm gonna I'm gonna assign that to a variable. And then I'm going to print the type of result. Now, what do you think the type is going to be when I add a float, a 3.5? to int age a float why what's the, what's the result what's the answer it'll have a number at the decimal because 3.5 plus 47 equals 50.5 so it be a float plus an int always equals a float and here let's print the result itself Okay, so when I run that, <clears throat> there we go, class float and 50.5. Let's make it a little more interesting. Let's, let's say I'm 47 and a half, much older than I actually am. Uh, float plus a float comes out to an even number no decimal, what do you think it's going to be? It'll be 51, but what, what, what? It'll give me an error first because I forgot to switch the data type on this. There we go. Now run it. You're right. It's still a float. So it gives me 51.0. Now, could I make that into an int? Yes, I can. So there are functions in Python for changing the data type. So if I say result equals, I'm gonna say, basically what I'm saying here is 
this is what's the, in, the, in the box called the result. There's this plus this. Now I'm saying, oh, wait a minute, I'm going to change what is in that box to something else. But guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to put something in that box that was already in that box, but I'm going to change it a little bit. So I'm going to use int, which is a return function that takes whatever you give it and returns an int. So if I take result and I return an int and I put it back in the box. So I'm taking the float out of the result box, changing it to an int, putting it back in the same box. That's all this means, which is totally legal to do. You can do it. And now, there we go, nice and clean, 51. But now, let's, let's have a little bit of fun with this. Okay, now I've thrown it back off again, 47.3 times 3.5. I'm still adding them together, but now I get 50.8, which is clearly not an int. So what's gonna happen when I run this now? Any guesses? Error? Who says error? Who says it'll modify the number to something else? Neither one is really desirable, by the way, right? Because you don't want automatic things happening in your program that you didn't mean to happen. But let's just see. Oh, it just drops it. Everything after the decimal, if you take a float and make it into an int, just gets dumped, which is a 0.8 difference. It seems like, ah, 0.8, you, whatever. If you were just doing like a basic $1 calculation, 0.8, not a big deal. But imagine if you're a banking institution that does that times a billion a day, right? Uh-oh, you just lost 800,000, 800 million dollars or whatever. That's a problem. So knowing what these things do is very interesting. Now, if I take result and what do you think will happen now if I'm trying to take result and now in that box, I'm putting str first name converting to an int. What's that? Yeah, it doesn't know what to do. Python's really good about like saying, okay, that's my limit. I don't know what to do there. And that's one of those times that it doesn't know what to do. But there's also... Okay, so now what do you think it's going to do? It will print it as a string, which will be invisible to you. But the, but the way we will know is because we're also printing the type right before that. And so... Just because something looks like a float or looks like an int, anything can be a string. Numbers and decimals can be a string. Emoji can be a string. Those a string just can't always be an int or a float. Yes. It's a group of any characters. It's the most wide open of all data types. So. just for fun. I'm gonna comment out that line. Okay, so I made this a comment. You can tell because it's got a hashtag in front of it and it's blue. That means it's just gonna skip it. So I can write anything here. I can write, this is my cool program or whatever. Comments are useful and comments are also something I'm gonna ask you to include in your code when you do, when you do programs. So I know what it is you're thinking when you write, a, when you write code. It helps me because if you write the wrong thing, it helps me understand and give you good feedback on what you need to change. Make sense? So this is a comment now. So result is going to add float score and fool married. Can it do it? Can it add true to 3.5? 
It can. Because guess what? The Boolean value of true has a numerical value of 1. So that's why you get 4.5. So you can't add true, even though it's a word, you can't combine it with a string because it, its value is actually 1. False is 0. So that's just good things to remember. So today in the sandbox assignment, this is literally the kind of stuff I would like you to do is just open it up, play around, try some things out, try and throw some errors, look at the errors, see what they mean. Try and combine different types of data, try different conversions. Okay, so bool, int, what are the other two? Boolean, integer, string, and float. So those are the four. All four of those have an associated function in Python that will convert data or try to convert data to that value. So if I, let's uncomment this. Think I can do that? Should be able to, right? And yes, I can. So if I take the number one, convert it to a Boolean, then it becomes true when I print it out. Yes, sir. What's that? This, this is just line numbers. Yeah, it's so, it's so we, we can refer to those in the program. They're not actually part of the program, but I can say, hey, take a look at line number four. You can see blah, 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 blah. Yeah. No, it does not. It just it's just an integer that I'm passing into that function. So I'm giving it an integer. So what if I put 12 in there and run it? Still true. So in order to get a zero or a false, I have to put zero. If it's greater than zero, then it should throw a true. Okay, any number greater than zero, even this one, should always be true. So basically, zero is false, anything else is true. 